All right. So James chapter number four, we're going to start here. Um, I'm reading out an NIV version again, re, uh, verses one through 10. And it says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You, not, you do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Verse 4, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs, he jealously longs for the spirit he has cause to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Number seven, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wave, Chain, wail, change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Number 10, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Then, whew, studying James makes you want to really get your life right. All right. Acts chapter number two, Acts chapter number two, Acts chapter number two. All righty. Verses one through 12. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house while they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Somebody say they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under the heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't, these all, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? That's how, then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? They're speaking in our native language, but aren't they Galileans? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and, Ampha, and, and Pamphra, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, amazed and perplexed. They ask one another, what does this mean? Before you be seated, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Um, today, title of today's message is Unbound, 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 Unbound. When the Spirit of God comes, he, it comes to set you free, okay? When we accept the Lord as our personal Lord and Savior, it isn't so that we can remain bound by what had us bound before we accepted him. His Spirit has come so that he may set us free, so that he can, we can be all that he has called us to be. Where you are now is not the subtotal of where God has called you. Amen? So he sends a shaking. He sends persecution. He sends things to get you from where you are to where he has called you to be. Amen? We're going to pray. Father God, we come before you today in the name of Jesus. We thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. We come before you as mere human beings, acknowledging God that we've not been perfect, acknowledging God that we've sinned against you in so many ways, but we come before you praying today for your grace and we pray for your mercy. We pray, Father God, that you mend every broken heart in this place, God. We pray, God, in the name of Jesus, that you renew minds, Father God, in such a way, God, that we call Abba Father instead of calling out to people, God. We pray in the name of Jesus that your spirit moves today in such a way God, 
that we are changed, not by man, not by intellect, not by anything that we have conjured up, but by your spirit. Do it for us, God, because we can't make it another day without you. Do it for us, God, because you said in your word, God, that everything that you've declared in our lives, God, will surely come to pass. You said in your word, God, that your word will not return unto you a void and that will accomplish everything that is set out to do. So set out to do, God, today, God, what only you can do. So we thank you for all that you've done and all that you've yet to do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody say amen. amen. Glory to his name. Amen. Glory to his name. So Pastor Outing started and kicked us off with a powerful message about three weeks ago. And at the beginning of the series, he talked about the letters that James wrote to the Jewish believers who were scattered throughout the Roman Empire. Throughout the letters, he's attempting to show that belief in Christ is not just an abstract or philosophical or eschatoric idea, but it is practical. In other words, when we say that we believe in Christ, it is just not an abstract idea. This letter is telling us that there should be some fruit in our lives indicating that we are doing what we say we believe. Amen? So in other words, he's saying it's not enough to just believe in Christ but the same tongue that we believe in Christ in also has to be the same tongue that gives him glory in the earth. The same tongue that says that we believe in God cannot be the same tongue that's used to put down others. What he's saying that we can't just say that we believe in Christ, but our lifestyles don't match up with what we say we believe. So throughout this letter, what he's doing is he's taking this idea of, believe, of believing in Christ from this, this supernatural thing, which it is, but to a practical day-to-day, -day, this is how you walk in it. Amen? Amen? So in other words, there must be a correlation between my faith and my actions. My brother preached a message the other day James, out of James 2, 20, verses 20 uh, through 22. And it said, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his, own, his only son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. So in other words, it wasn't just his faith. It was his actions in connection with his faith. Amen? So when we look at that word action, it comes from the word ergon. Ergon it is a Greek word. It means it's a God-ordained action. So in other words, when we have faith in God and we are doing what God called us to do, it is not us that is doing it. It is God empowering us to do the very thing that he has called us to do. And the reason he empowers us with it, with his spirit, it's because when it happens, when it comes to pass, we cannot ourselves get the glory. We can only give God the glory. Why? Because without his spirit moving through us, that thing would have never been done. So some of us have got to get out of the habit of giving ourselves the glory when something is done because it is not us that did it. It is the power of God that is working through us to accomplish the very thing that he called us to do. Somebody give God praise for just a second because you know that you could not worship the way you do. You would not be anointed the way that you are had it not been the hand of God on your life. So what he is saying Okay, so let's reread with that new understanding, with that understanding in mind. Let's reread James 20. He says, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? In other words, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without the hand of God is useless? You see that? So in other words, there are moments in our life where, we could, where something isn't working out in our life because we're believing for something that, God, that does not have God's hand on it. There are moments where we go in directions that, did not, that God did not ordain, okay? And just because his hand is on you, it does not mean his hand is on everything you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Just because God's hand is upon you, it does not mean he has not called you to do every single thing that you are trying to do. That is why we wonder why my anointing works here, but my anointing does not work there. Why my anointing works in this position, but it doesn't work in that position. Why my anointing works in this house, but it does not work in that house. Why? Because there's a hand. Because we cannot change. See, see this thing on the, see, we, we get into this, this thing of comparison, right? 
where we're comparing ourselves against what everybody else is doing. We get on the internet, we get on social media, we get on all of these different things and we see what somebody else is doing and we try to do what somebody else is doing. Not realizing that they're doing it because they were anointed to do it. As believers, we have to stop comparing, we have to stop competing, and we have to get in our own lane. Somebody say, get in your own lane. Get in your own lane. If God did not call you to it, get in your own lane. If God did not call you to do it, get in your own lane. If God did not anoint you to do it, get in your own lane. How much further would our lives and our walk be if we got in our own lane? Somebody say, get in your own lane. Get in your own lane. So James is writing this letter to a group of believers. These are believers that were not Gentiles, but they were uh, uh, converted Jews, okay? So the three, there are three things that James is up against when he's writing these letters. For one, they were scattered. In other words, they were isolated, okay? They were set up all across the place. That's the first problem. The second problem is that they once were believers in the law, Okay, And now they've been converted into this ideology of grace and mercy. So they've been brought up or shaped or framed with an idea of who God is. So now they're trying to rethink of who they know God is. They're no longer waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah has come. So how do I live out my life as a believer in the new way that Christians are supposed to live? That's the second thing. The third problem that they're up against is that they're in a land with a lot of idolatry, okay? So they got outside forces working against them, and they got inside forces working against them, amen? But the Spirit of God says that he came to what? Set captives free, all right? So when we have things in us that are binding us, when we have things surrounding us that are binding us, there's only one thing that can happen that can set his captives free. And what is that? The power of God, the anointing of God, the grace of God, the favor of God, Christ uh, working through us, around us, and in us. That is the only way that some of these chains can be broken. Sometimes we go to people with it for advice and the chains are not broken. Sometimes we run to family members who deal with the same issues that de- we're dealing with and the chain is not broken. The only way chain can be broken is when Christ is leading you out of your brokenness. Okay, He's leading you from a place of being broken into out of brokenness. Amen? All right, so... Let's go back to verse number in James, glory to his name. In James number, chapter number four, he says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have. So you kill, you covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. Point number one, watch what you desire. Watch what you desire. The Bible says that out of the heart flows the issues of life. In other words, we speak what's in our heart. We speak what is in our heart. If we were framed and shaped in iniquity, whatever house you grew up in, a lot of times that frames what's in your heart. Most, many of us were not brought up in a Christian household, even though many of us were. Unfortunately, a lot of us were brought up in situations that did not teach us what who Christ was, did not show us the right way, did not show us Christ like a lot of us, unfortunately, in our communities. We come from single parent households, we come from all of these different situations. But Christ came to set us free from our thinking about these situations. Does that make sense? In other words, just because my daddy left don't mean I have to leave. Okay? Just because my mom was strung out on drugs does not mean I have to be strung out on drugs. Just because my friends went to prison growing up does not mean I have to go to prison when I grow up. In other words, God has sent Christ so that we may break bonds and so that he may break things off of us and through us and from around us so that we can be everything that he has called us to be. Glory to his name. At my job, we, we talk a lot about culture. And in culture... It says that the culture is created by the language or the words that are spoken, okay? So your house is a culture. The words that are spoken in your house becomes the culture of your house, okay? The words spoken in this house becomes the culture of the house. So if we speak words of faith, 
then our culture is one that believes that God can do abundantly above all that we can ask or think. If we remember, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. So if my house believes that it can go after whatever it is that God has put in me, that means I believe that, my, that God can go, that I can go after everything that God has put in me. Why? Because I've been framed in a house that says faith without works is dead. Amen. Point number two. And this one, this one hurt, y'all. This one hurt. Number four, he says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace? That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. In other words, cheating can get you killed. Okay. Let me, let me, let me, <laughs> let me bet you. <laughs> when I say cheating can get you killed, what God is saying is that he's given his people the spirit of God, his spirit, okay? So he longs for that spirit that is within him, within us. So if we make the choice to go after the worldly things, to idolatry, if we go after things that are pleasing our flesh as opposed to pleading the, uh, pleasing the spirit of God that is within us, that means we are adulterous and we are cheating on God. Okay, And if we remember from the Old Testament, God is a jealous God. The only reason why God has not wiped some of us out is because of his grace and because of his mercy. Because he has given us time to get things right. But there are moments where time will run out, y'all. And let's just be honest. Can I just be honest? Time, grace and mercy will not be forever. There will come a time when the Savior will come. There will come a time where he will take us home. And if we are not right, and if our lives are not right, there's a chance that we may not even make it to heaven. So what God is calling us to do is to be Christians, to be believers in Christ, to not just say that we are Christians, but do the things that Christ has called us to do. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Verse number seven, however, says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near. In other words, he gives you a way of escape, y'all. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. In other words, don't live for the world one day and live for God the next day. Live for world one day, live for God the next day. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. How many of you know that God is a lifter? Sometimes God will let us get so far out to where we have no choice but to call on him. Sometimes God will send persecution our way for two reasons. One, so we can become saved for real. And two, so he can draw us, call us higher. There is a level in this room that God has called you to. He is, not, he is not satisfied with you being less than what he has called you to. So what God will do is send persecution. He will send things your way to shake you, to shake you, to shake you, to get you to move from one level of faith up to another level of faith. Does that make sense? So in other words, there is another level in God that he has called you to. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. He is calling us higher, church. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. And when I say calling us higher, I'm not talking about more money. Okay. When I say calling us higher, I'm not talking about a new title at my job. When I say calling us higher, I'm not talking about something else I can add to my resume. When I say calling us higher, I'm not talking about connections with new friends in powerful places. I'm talking about higher as in an authentic relationship with my Savior, okay? There's another level in him that he has called us to. And the only way we can get to that level is by building a closer relationship to Christ. How do we have to get, why, and, and I never understood why God has to send persecution for us to act right. Why does he have to take things away for us to know, to, for us to, to fall back in love with him? Why does he have to take things that we once that, that, that we once prayed for, they have now become our idols. 
He has to strip away so that we can know that he is the one and only and living and true God. You serve a Savior that is alive, that is true, and he is a lifter. He is calling for his people to come back to him. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Accomplishing stuff is good. That is wonderful, but not if it becomes your God. Meeting new people, becoming, uh, uh, getting up to the next level financially is great, but not if it becomes your God. Getting a new house is wonderful. It is beautiful, fabulous, but it means nothing if it's re replacing our relationship with Christ. So the question is, what is replacing our relationship with Christ today? What is replacing it? What is replacing it? Who is replacing it? What ideas are replacing it? What tangible items are replacing it? What relationships are replacing it? Mm -hmm. Are my children replacing them? Is my bank account replacing them? These are things that we have to ask ourselves because God is calling us higher. This, in Romans it says, all things work together for the good of the called of, them, of all those that love God and are called according to his purpose. If you are called according to his purpose, if you are called, that means everything, everything good, everything bad, everything in between is going to work together for his good. I don't care what happened this year, it's going to work for his good. I don't care what happened last year, it's going to work for your good. Why? Because you are the called. If you are the called, give God some praise in this place. If you know that you are the called, give God some praise. If you know that he is calling you higher, give him some praise in this place. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. And the powerful thing about the scriptures, they were sown in a place that they had no idea that they would be going to. God sent persecution, shook the church, they went everywhere. They went to places that they didn't know God had already tilled the soil for them in advance. When my wife and I um, uh, got a house last year, when we got the house, the grass, and the, the, you know, it took us like one or two months to move in. The grass had started dying. We got there, and the grass was dead everywhere in the front and the back. And I'm looking at her. She's looking at me, and I'm like, how are we going to fix this? She's like, I don't know. You the man. Anyway true story. She didn't say it, but she just gave me that look. <laughs> so we in there, and then I find out we have sprinklers. I brought the house, and I didn't even know we had sprinklers. And they're like, they're sprinklers. And I'm like, well, how are the sprinklers going to, why are they not coming on? As it turns out, you got to have, what is the name of that water again? What is it? Irrigation. Irriga yeah, I had no idea. Had to be turned on. So we turned it on, right? And I'm thinking, all of this grass is dead. How many sprinklers are out here? Because I can't even see how the sprinklers are going to fix this big old mess. Lo and behold, my wife gets the water turned on. I come home, and I'm excited because there are sprinklers everywhere. Water was everywhere once we turned the water on. But it wasn't until I trusted God and we got to a place, once we got to that moment, then we saw what was underneath the soil, okay? There are times where God is going to send you places there are times where he's going to ask you to do something, and you will not know what is going to happen until you get to that place. Once you get to that place, that is when what he had, what he had uh, underneath the ground, underneath the soil, that is when it will get, begin to manifest. So in other words, I know you're scared, I know you're afraid, and I know you don't know how things are going to work out. But God is saying just trust him, and when you get there, it's going to be more than what you can imagine. In other words, when you get to that place, when you get to that place that he has called you to, there will be things that are hidden that will be unveiled that you didn't even have in mind. Glory to his name. So we're going to pray today that we trust God on a level that we've never trusted him before. And we're going to pray today that whatever has us bound in this season, that whatever it is that has us bound, that God will send a fresh wind in our lives to take those shackles off. Glory to his name. I know we in church, and I know a lot of times we just want to look pretty, but there are shackles that some of us are wearing, glory to his name, that are, um, that are, that are hidden by the mask that we, not the physical mask, but hidden by the mask that we wear, glory to his name. But God, he is a healer. God is a lifter. Father God, we come before you today in the name of Jesus. 
we thank you so much, Father God, for allowing us to see another day. We come before you today, God, acknowledging that we have not been perfect, but acknowledging, God, that your sovereignty has always been there. Acknowledging, God, there are moments, God, where we've allowed things, God, to replace you. And we ask, God, that you forgive us. We know that there are moments, God, where we chase the bag instead of chasing you. We come asking, God, that you forgive us. We know, Father God, in the name of Jesus, that there's a thing or a place that you've called us to. We can't quite describe it. We can't quite, we just know that it is there. We know, God, that there's another level in you that you've called us to, God. But we ask, God, in the name of Jesus, that your grace, your mercy, and your power, God, continue to rest on us. We pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus, that you begin to make every crooked place straight that you begin to order our steps, God, that you begin to align our lives, God, with what you've called us to do. We pray, God, in the name of Jesus, that you begin removing people, God, removing voices, God, that do not mean us any good, God. We declare in the name of Jesus that every bond and every bondage from words spoken over, over us, God, they will be broken in the name of Jesus. We declare in the name of Jesus that every single thing, God, every place, God, that you've called us to, that before we get there, God, it will be fertile, God, that before we get there, God, it will be everything that you ordained it to be, God. So we declare in the name of Jesus, glory to your name, that you are a good God, and we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for keeping us. We thank you for being our Savior. We thank you for being our King. So we thank you, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Somebody give him glory in this place. Give him glory in this place. He is worthy. Give him glory in this place. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Allow God to set you free.